Hey there guys, this is Mr. Gonzalez with our uh, first test review. This is for our matter lesson. Um, so grab your notebook and follow along in your notes. Uh, and basically if you have any questions about anything uh, that you need you know, better explained, uh, just come see me, okay? So here we go. All right, so our matter lesson, we started talking about what is matter, and we basically said matter is everything, anything that takes up space and has some sort of mass, uh, just like this rock and this awesome tarantula. And remember, our, our, uh, our course is broken up into fall is matter and spring is energy. And the difference is energy travels in waves, where matter is particles, okay? Now, we talked about if there was a glass of a clear liquid, and someone said, here, drink this. Um, and if you didn't know it was water, how could you figure out if it is water? And we talked about what, what are some things you can do. And some of you were like, taste it, uh, not smart. Uh, there's other ways to figure out that it's water. So we said, can you smell it? All right, water's odorless. Um, and then we said you need to run some tests, and you guys had awesome answers. You said you can test the pH you can sort of poke it uh, to test how like it's feeling, you know, because if it's oily or has some kind of a other feeling, uh, it's not water. But the main thing you can do is you can sort of freeze it and boil it because water has specific freezing and boiling. And uh, if you can, you know, we said zero degrees is when it boils, sorry, when it freezes and 100 degrees C is when it boils. Uh, so these are called physical properties um, and you can also run some chemical property tests to see uh, what are done so that was our first thing we can figure out what matter is and this is what scientists work with all the time matter is basically uh, can be organic matter or inorganic matter the difference being that organic matter is something that is living or was once alive or a product of a living organism uh, so this apple is organic Salt, we said, is inorganic. Your pencil was tricky. Your pencil has graphite, which is a mineral, which is inorganic, but it also has wood, which comes from a tree, which is organic. Oil was a tricky one as well. That one's organic because oil is a fossil fuel that comes from uh, stinky old uh, fossils, uh, which uh, see old de dead sea animals under um, the ocean floor. Uh, become oil. Blood, uh, mostly organic, but there are inorganic traces. We said there's little minerals and iron. Your blood has iron, which is uh, inorganic. So that one's also a both. And oxygen, the gas that's in the air, uh, although it's produced by uh, trees, is inorganic. It's an inorganic um, gas. Uh, matter comes in three flavors. Uh, what we mean by that is uh, its phases. Matter comes in, of course, solid, liquid, gas. There's another phase, but we don't cover it. Um, the other phase is called plasma. Don't worry about that one. Solid, liquid, gas are the three main phases we'll focus on. And these are also known as the, s the states of matter. Now, what determines what um, state that the matter is in is its molecules. So basically all matter has these little molecules that hang out and they sort of, depending on how they move next to each other, gives you what phase the matter is in. And what makes them move? Well, temperature. So molecular configuration determines what the matter is. Is it a solid, liquid, or gas? And the thing that changes the molecules around is the temperature. If you increase the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy. That means you increase the movement of the molecules. And the more they move, the more they are sort of less solid and they're more gassy. So let's look at that. Ice, for example, the particles are very close together and can't move too much. They're very, uh, they have a specific structure. If they melt, the molecules start to slide past each other a little bit. They're still very together, but they're moving past each other and they're further apart. That's a liquid. And if you heat that up and they go insane and crazy, they start to pop off and uh, the particles move very fast and spread out and that gives you a boiling, gives you a gas. We used an analogy in class, soldiers are your solid. 
We said a party is like a liquid. People are contained in the room, but sort of move around. <laughs> and the last one is uh, soccer. They are a gas, because soccer players can pretty much freely go everywhere they want, even out of the arena. Yeah. All right, so these are some terms that we sort of said but didn't write down. Solidification, melting, condensing, and evaporating. Solidification, becoming a solid. So that's when you freeze something. Melting, becoming a liquid. Condensing, to condense is when a gas becomes a liquid. Sort of like in your shower where the steam touches the mirror and condenses so it becomes droplets of water. And evaporating, you know what that is. That's liquid becoming gas. Now matter can be broken down into other categories besides inorganic and organic. They can be pure substances and mixtures. Now pure substances include elements. Now elements we said are basically on the periodic table and there's about a hundred of them and an element is basically can't be broken down any further. So um, an aluminum for example, aluminum is on the periodic table. Um, it can't be broken down into any other Parts. Now it has its own parts, like little subatomic molecules, protons, electrons, neutrons, um, but basically it's aluminum. Unlike compounds like water, uh, salt, that's sodium chloride, and CO2 in the air, they're made up of different elements, okay, combined together. So, but both are considered pure substances. Pure substances can't be broken down physically. They have to be, uh, compounds I mean, can't be broken down physically. They have to be broken down chemically. Now mixtures um, can be characterized into two. Homogeneous or homogeneous and heterogeneous. Homogeneous is basically there's no visible different parts. That means if you're looking at salt water like in the ocean, it looks just like water but there's tons of things dissolved in there. If you take a random sample of salt from maybe the shore and then swim out very far uh, out a little bit, you'll pretty much have the same configuration of salt water. As opposed to a rock, this is a piece of granite. Oh, sorry. A homogeneous mixture is also known as a solution. A heterogeneous mixture has, is like a chocolate chip cookie, where if you just take a corner of the cookie, it may be different than the center of the cookie, which might have more chips and stuff like that. So there's no visibly different parts, and random sample give you uh, unequal proportions. So, we had a game. Is it a compound, an element, a homogeneous mixture, or a heterogeneous mixture? So we said salt. Hmm, well salt... Salt is a compound because it's made up of two elements. Trail mix, that's a heterogeneous mixture because it's a big mess of different things. Gold is on the periodic table, it's an element. Sand is a heterogeneous mixture because if you just take a handful of sand, you know, you're going to get different little particles in there from the other from another handful. Air is a homogeneous mixture because air is made up of, it has nitrogen in it, it has oxygen in it, carbon dioxide, all in the same proportions. And sugar. Sugar is a compound. Sugar is uh, an organic compound. We had a little fun activity. Remember we played with the oil and the water? Remember that? Well, that was an example of m messing with a mixture and sort of going from hetero to uh, homogeneous. So we took a little bit of water in a test tube and we put oil on top and then remember we mixed it and nothing happened, it didn't really mix. So these were two separate uh, things and what we did was we made the heterogeneous mixture when we put soap in there, soap combined the two because soap is what's known as an emulsifier and so it made it into a homogeneous mixture. Okay. Now. Just so you understand, checkpoint, what's the difference between an element and a compound? Remember, elements can't be broken down any further. Uh, by the way, these are both pure substances, but elements can't be broke down any further. Compounds can, by chemical means. For example, CO2 can be broken down into carbon and oxygen. What's the difference between a compound and a mixture, then? Because a compound's made up of stuff, and mixture is made up of stuff. 
Well, a compound like salt, again, has to be only broken down by physical, uh, sorry, by chemical means. A compound can only be broken down by chemical means, but a mixture can be broken down by physical means. So if I wanted to get the salt out of the ocean water, I could boil the water away. That's a physical way to get rid of the water and the salt, to separate them. But if I want to get rid of the sodium and the chloride and make them, I need some, chemi some chemical reaction to take place. So this guy, he snorts out seawater all the time, which evaporates on his nose, and he gets crusty, solid salt because that's a physical change. The evaporation takes place on his nose, and he has salt all on his nose. Those are not boogers. Properties of matter. We then talked about what are some properties of matter. How can we define what matter is like? And we gave you a mystery matter, which ended up being a tootsie roll. But this piece of matter, if you had to figure out, hey, what is this thing, this alien thing, this poopy-looking thing, what is it? Well, what you can do is you can say that all matter has physical and chemical properties, which we can test. A physical property is anything that you can observe that doesn't change the makeup of the matter. Where a chemical property, if you run some chemical tests, will change the matter. That's called a reaction. So let's do it. If you add this little guy right here, you can figure out at the top for physical properties. We can see its color. We can sort of put it on a triple beam balance and find its mass. We can find its volume. We can melt it. We can bring it back by condensing it. We can find its boiling point. Um, you guys said we can squeeze it. We can smell it. All that stuff. Those are physical properties. Now, at the bottom, if you run a reaction, like you can burn it to see what's left over, well, you can't get that Tootsie Roll back. That's a chemical reaction, okay? And that's a chemical property. How does it burn, okay? If we put acid on it, we could see how it reacts with acid. That's a chemical reaction, okay? A chemical property. One physical property we talked about a lot was solubility. We wanted to figure out, hey, what happens to the salt when you put it in water? Okay, and the definition is the ability to uh, dissolve. We have two things. We have something called a solute and a solvent. Now, we tried to come up with fun ways to remember basically which is which. We said that the solvent, which is the water usually, is a longer word and is usually bigger, like you have a lot of water. And solute, which is a smaller word, is like the salt. So the solute dissolves in the solvent. Okay? And when you get the two together, you get a solution. So how does the salt dissolve in water? What happens to the salt? It totally disappears. You don't see it anymore. And we talked a little bit quickly about how these molecules actually have charges. And we know that opposite charges attract. So water has a positive charge near hydrogen and a negative charge near its oxygen. That's H2O there. And NaCl, which is salt, has a positive on the sodium and a negative on the chloride ion. These are called ions. And when you basically mix the two, they sort of do a little dance where the sodium gets sort of pulled away by the negative side of the oxygen and the positive side of the hydrogen sort of pulls away the chloride there. And so the salt gets taken apart but still hooked up to the water. Okay? This is a physical change because if you get rid of the uh, water, if you boil the water away, the sodium and the chlorine come back together. They're just sort of still. Nothing has changed. Everybody's still there, okay? Then we did, remember the gum lab? Remember? Well, that was part of the lesson was to figure out, hey, how can we determine percent composition in a mixture of matter? And uh, it's pretty easy. If you've got the, if I give you the grams of one thing and the grams of the other thing, you can figure out percent like this. So for that salt water problem, um, mass of water uh, subtracted by mass of salt over total mass times 100. So, for example, if there's 345 grams of water subtracted from 23 grams of salt divided by the total mass, because I just add those two, 368 grams, you times 100, and you end up with 322 over 368 equals, now on your calculator, make sure you punch in 322 first divided by 368, you get 0.875 times 100 is 87.5%. That means there's 87.5% what? There's 87.5% uh, uh, water, okay? And the rest is salt. You could do a pie graph for that. And that's what we did with the gum. 
We also did it backwards with pennies. I gave you the uh, percent copper and percent zinc, and you had to give me the mass. So what you did was you found the mass, um, you basically found the mass of the entire penny, and then you used a little bit of math skills to find 95% of that to find out copper and zinc, okay? So be ready for that too. Then we moved into, well, how do we know matter is around? How do we know it actually exists? And we talked about our senses and the nervous system, how it picks up all this stuff, okay? And so that'll be a separate review movie. And lastly, we said, how do we change matter? We can change matter two ways. We can change it physically or chemically. And simply, physically, it maintains its physical properties. Chemical completely changes the physical property. It changes into something totally new. Terms used to describe physical change. Bend, break, cut, grind, slice, tear, shatter, boil, freeze, melt. Now the only weirdos are boil, freeze, melt. That seems strange. If you boil water, it's physical change? It totally is because it stays as H2O. That means if I boil water and it goes into steam, well, I can capture that steam and make it back into water. We didn't change anything, okay? Burn, rot, explode, ferment, corrode, rust. These are chemical changes. Chemical changes totally give you something new. Um, and you can't usually reverse chemical changes, okay? Chemical reactions can be written as reactants give you a product. And the way you say makes or gives you is with an arrow. So that looks something like this. If you had some hydrogen with some oxygen, you would make water. So two hydrogens plus uh, oxygen molecule gives you two molecules of water. This is called a chemical reaction. Then we showed one in class with our elephant's toothpaste, which showed you that everything changed. Remember the elephant's toothpaste changed color. Um, the tube got warm, all that stuff. So here are some clues that a chemical reaction has taken place. The first thing is energy absor is absorbed or given off. If a reaction is uh, gives off heat, that's an example of something that uh, is a chemical change that occurred. Do you make some sort of gas, liquid, or solid? Now this isn't always a chemical reaction because, of course, uh, gas, liquid, and solid can be made with physical changes, right? But just know that if you make a gas, liquid, or solid, it's sometimes evidence of a chemical change. Like in the, in the elephant's toothpaste reaction, we made uh, oxygen. That's why it made bubbles. Bubbles. And three, if you change the color or the odor changes, chances are a chemical reaction is taking place. All right? So that's pretty much it for matter right now. If you have any questions, just ask. Good luck.